believe that eight years ago we launched this church. Eight years ago, January 9, 2011. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the service, but this is our eighth anniversary. And on the back of your bulletins, you'll see that you're being invited to join me and Pam and Kenny this Wednesday at either 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. or both when we will be in a time of prayer for our church, for our church family. I can assure you we'll go down the list and, and we'll think of where you sit on Sunday mornings and, and we'll look at Facebook and we'll remember people who have been here who perhaps have gone on to another church family or, or, or people who haven't yet come. And that's what we're going to be praying about on Wednesday at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. on our 8th anniversary. We invite you to join us wherever you may be. The three of us are going to be split around. Pam will probably be doing her day job. Kenny will be doing his and I'll be doing mine. But rest assured, at those two times, we're going to be praying for our church and our church family and of what next for us. We invite you to join us. And the next Sunday morning after worship, we'll have our annual congregational meeting where we will talk and inform you of who the new council will be. Those folks who are behind the scenes working very hard to keep things going in our church. We'll also talk about our budget. So we hope you'll join us for that brief meeting after worship next Sunday. We also have server sign-ups in the fellowship hall. And Stacy Green, our vice moderator, is being so helpful. And that's for people who want to help serve diaconate. Perhaps you want to help prepare hospitality, and I don't know if you got there today, but Billy Metcalf always knocks it out of the park. There's gravy and biscuits and ham, biscuits and fruit and lemon bars. But don't think that the bars that high, we always know that Billy and Deb are going to show out. <laughs> Brent and I pop a lid. <laughs> so it's just the time, the main thing a time for us to gather before or after worship. So if you didn't get a bite to eat before today, feel free to go in there afterwards and just sit and, and, and have some food and share bread with those in the family. But if you'd like to help do that, there's a sign up for that as well. And then for NOSH, which I'm going to talk about now, many of you who are members here know that we started this about two years ago. And friends, we started because we found out there were some in our congregation that were food deprived. And so we started something called NOSH, No One Stays Hungry. And what that means is that we have a couple ways of doing that. We have a small food pantry in the first room past the fellowship hall on your left. There are bags in there. If you or someone you know need some food, just go in there and throw it in a bag, take it to them, or take it home. Or maybe you pass someone on the street with a sign that says, I'm hungry. We invite you on the back of the door. There's going to be, Jeff, is there still something back there? So we have some Rice chicken and green beans and cupcakes. All right. So we had teenagers yesterday, and a lot of our teenagers were a little sick, so we're having teenagers leftovers back there. But it's going to be wonderful. Think about what it would be to hand someone a piece of chicken, some green beans, and a cupcake for someone who's down the street might be hungry. Maybe it's you. No questions asked. Just take it on the way out the door because, indeed, we don't want anyone to be hungry. This next thing was going to be Pastor Pam's announcement, but we had to work around some mics. But I am so happy. Uh, Pam, just grab that mic from Cindy and tell us about that blanket drive. But you, you came up with this initiative, and I love it. I want you to talk about it. So for the month of January, we're collecting blankets for the Catholic Action Center. We're joining other congregations in this community. We're hoping to give them 200 blankets. Um, they have a lot of people coming during these months, and they run out of beds really quickly. But they always try to have a blanket for anyone who's cold. Sometimes they sleep in chairs. So if you've got extra blankets laying around their house, they're not picky. They'll take gently used. They'll take new. They'll take whatever, because when you're cold, it doesn't matter, and we don't want anybody to be cold. I like it. No one stays hungry, no one stays cold, friends. And, and I just love when Pam contacted uh, Kenny and I and said, this is an opportunity to collaborate with churches across our city that maybe perhaps we don't always collaborate with. Maybe they worship differently. Maybe they have different beliefs. But isn't it wonderful when we can join together and do God's work in the world? So we invite you to, to bring those all in January. Then next Sunday, we will start another series called Drawn In, Leaving, Living the Creative Life with God. And we're really looking forward to that time in the next six weeks leading us up to Lent when we will think about our creative life and what, how God has made each one of us uniquely. 
So we hope you'll join us next Sunday as we begin that. Church, let's sing a bit about this church we dream about and that we hope to be. Will we pray for all the young lives cut short by fear and shame?
Encourages time for us to share our joys and concerns with each other. And if you've got something going on in your life and you're worried, rest assured if you throw your name out there, we're going to be saying it this week. And our prayers will be holding you up. So what's on your heart today, church? Ms. Elmore. I am a grandson. He's a scared grandson, baby. I don't feel like that. I don't go by step and step and all that. He's my grandson. And he has a, yesterday he went to the doctor for a Thursday and he was diagnosed with brain cancer. Oh. And I just want to take the credit for him. What's his name, Ms. Elmore? Chris Collins. Um, we have a couple friends, Miles and Julie, and Miles' father came down, with, was diagnosed with leukemia in August, and uh, he went into hospice uh, a few weeks ago, and his other son, Marcus, Miles' brother, was taking care of him, and not this past Friday, but the previous Friday, Marcus overdosed on heroin and died. And his father died on Sunday. And they, Miles and Julie are just worn out. They're worn out and tired, and it's been really hard. So, just prayers to you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm just praying for our country because of the ongoing government shutdown. That obviously affects anyone. I know it's crying and scary having our government go through that and not get along. So, just praying they reopen the government. I want to thank God for this church, and uh, as most everybody on Facebook knows, Bill was in the hospital this week. He had seizures, and thank God all the tests they did were negative, and they just determined that they needed to increase his medication. So he's back with me. And he looks much better today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, one of my best friends' uh, brother was in the hospital. He's in a coma. He, uh, over the weekend, he got that, uh, it's like flesh eating bacteria. And so he's in pretty bad shape. His kidneys have shut down. He's only like 35. And uh, my mom in your prayer. She had a small stroke last week and she didn't bother to tell any of us. <laughs> what were you doing? Bonnie, what, what's your friend's name? Nick. Joe. I'm sure you can understand what my prayer request is going to be. <laughs> We're a little overwhelmed um, with the upcoming big, huge, gigantic move <laughs> that we're moving to another country. Um, but also, kind of keep tailoring your prayers. She's struggling living with her dad, and she's just she's got a lot going on that child, and she just she needs all the prayers and good energy she can get. So uh, whatever path it is that God has laid out for her, that she can figure it out. Team. I just want to take time to thank God for everything He does for me. And I uh, started feeding the birds again, but the weather's getting bad, and I really enjoy that. We need to really take time and see God's beauty out here. Uh, all this is for us. We should enjoy it. Uh, up all the little animals that don't have anybody and people out there that don't have anybody that need somebody. Uh, I have a cousin that had a car accident back in November and she fell down the steps and hurt her hip and but she's still going and moving on which she needs to go to the doctor and she's like me, she's too tough to go. Uh, remember all my work. And just a couple of things. First for me, as this um, next semester starts next week, I'm taking a breath for a couple seconds, and the semester is about to start again. So just prayers for this. It's going to be a power bird to the end of the year. Um, so prayers for that, and also for um, the uh, the women that I work with on a daily basis, just that are in the, the throes of addiction. Just um, prayers for them and their families, and, and um, all the situations that they're dealing with, with, with on a consistent basis. Pam, as Kenny came in today um, and was here, he was getting a text. Many of us heard of a really bad accident on I-75 mm -hmm. early this morning, uh, and six people were killed in that accident. 
and um, an SUV um, it just exploded, and so the VIN was burned up, the plates were burned up, so they had to move the car to even identify, attempt to. So there's a long process ahead for that, and so we, we, we pray for, for first responders and, and people who come on those situations day in and day out, and certainly we pray for family members who are going to get some horrific news sometime in the next several hours. Prayers for that. We also want to remember J.R. this morning, our dear faith friend. He's had some surgery this week and has requested that we continue to keep him in prayer. Others? Let's prepare our hearts for prayer. <laughs> Now we pray. 
pray for your presence and healing for Miss Elmore's grandson. Particularly, we pray for him by name. We pray for Chris. We pray for the family of, of Miles and Julie and for the grief that they're experiencing. Be with them. Be at the gray side. Be at the times when they go home. We pray for our country, as Kevin mentioned. And God, we lift up Bonnie's friend, Nick, and pray for Bonnie's mom for continued recovery. God, we thank you that Bill is here with us today, and the doctors have found something to help him. And we pray for Joe and her family as they move across the country to Germany to settle down for a bit, to change the world in that little neck of the woods. May they always feel our love lifting them up. Give them calm and guidance as they prepare to leave, and we pray especially for Taylor. God, we thank you for Stanley and for the way he always remembers us to look at the world and see the beauty. And we lift all his regular prayer concerns, knowing that you hear us and that you respond. God, we thank you for Daniel and for the gifts he brings to this church. And we pray particularly as he continues his journey toward finishing his education so that he can change the world in all the places that he can. We pray especially for those that he encounters daily who are opiate addicted, who are struggling to find something. <coughs> God, we know that something is you. So please share your life there for Daniel with those women. In silence, we pray for that, which is most heavy on our hearts today. Thank you for each person gathered in this place, and we ask that you continue to fill us up with your love, that you pulse through our veins, that each person we see and meet sees a sparkle of your love in our encounter for the world's needs. For that's what they need, a little light from you. Move over us, God. Move within us, God, and continue to change us so that we can do what we can where we can to change the world. May it be so. Amen.
The private parts of our body that aren't presentable are the ones that are given the most dignity. The parts of our body that are presentable don't need this. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the part with less honor, so that there won't be division in the body, and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all the parts celebrate with it. You are the body of Christ and parts of each other. In the church, God has appointed first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, the ability to help others, leadership skills, different kinds of tongues. All our apostles are they. All our prophets are they. All our teachers are they. All don't perform miracles, do they? All don't have gifts of healing, do they? All don't speak in different tongues, do they? All don't interpret, do they? Use your ambition to try to get the greater gifts. If I'm going to show you an even better way. Good morning, church. Good morning. What an honor and a joy it is to be here with you this morning. And uh, I love to go to travel. As a, as a kid, I had the opportunity to uh, travel down to southern Kentucky where my great-grandmother uh, taught me the love of God. And so I traveled right through from Illinois to through Lexington growing up. It's great to be back in this part of the country and sharing uh, the word of God with you. Let us pray together. Oh, Holy Spirit, your word has been shared this morning. And as we meditate on it, as we share our lives together and uh, figure out what you are calling us towards, open our eyes, open our ears that we may see and hear you afresh and anew this morning, that we may be your disciples. In the name of Jesus the Christ we pray, amen. amen. One of the best things I get to do about this job is I get to travel and get to be in congregations like this. I love getting to meet you, I love getting to hear what God is up to in your midst, and I just love hearing about these eight great years you all have had in this community. So it's wonderful to be here. Well, a couple of uh, months ago, I had the, the um, opportunity to travel again through this area down to Berea. Um, I, many of you are familiar with Kent Gilbert down there, and his stepfather had passed away. And uh, they were having a memorial service, so I went down just to be with him, to be present with him as, as his pastor for that day. And when I was going down there, their associate pastor, Rachel, said, would you have dinner with me? And I said, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, she says, okay, meet me at Noodles Nirvana. Anybody ever been to Noodles Nirvana? A couple people, right? Okay, good. Nobody knows Noodles Nirvana anywhere else in the conference, so this is good. And um, I walk in. I'm the, I, I get there before she gets there, and I walk in, and you immediately know, those of you who've been, you immediately know this is a different kind of business. It's not your typical restaurant. So you walk in, and, it, and it's very um, it's very quaint. It's, it's small, kind of kind of dining roomish, like with wood floors, and um, there there are no servers. You just go up, and there's any kind of noodle you would want, thin, long, wide, uh, any kind of uh, protein and vegetable you'd like. And the people that own it are the people that are there at the cash registers welcoming you in. They're just it's just warm environment, right? Um, that to me is wonderful, but it's not the best part of that experience. When you walk in the door, <coughs> you can't help but notice something that's incredibly different. On the wall, immediately, immediately when you walk in the front door, is a, a white wall. And that white wall has at the very top one sentence in big, bold, black letters, and then below it, a paragraph uh, written below it. That top sentence says this, we belong to each other. We belong to each other. Now, as a Christian, I immediately knew that reference because it is a reference to the great Mother Teresa who said, if we do not have peace in this world, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. And I immediately made the reference, okay, so this particular restaurant has an ethic. They have a very different understanding of the world. That when you walk in this business, they believe that we all belong to each other. So I go up and I, I pay for my food, and they ask if you'd like to give a tip today. Now, there are no servers. And they explain to you that 100% of your tip 
would go to pay for the ministry or the charity or global charity that are, they're supporting for that particular year. And on the wall, underneath that, that big title, We Belong to Each Other, is a description of that ministry or global charity that they support. In the year of 2016, it is my understanding from Rachel, they gave over 50000 not fifteen, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 away in tips of their own money. Now, I have two kids, so I'm, I'm trying to do the math there for a minute, right? I'm not a mathematician, but I can, I can, I can pretty much guarantee that by the time my kids are ready for college, $50,000 a year of my own money goes a long way, maybe not all the way but <laughs> these days, but goes a long way to help me pay for my kids' college. And they're giving it away. Why? Because they belong, they believe we belong to each other. That the world needs that kind of giving that kind of light, that kind of love. So it's a different kind of business. And I couldn't help but think, when I walked out of that business that day, walked out of that restaurant, not only was, did I feel very full and um, was very rich in good food, I immediately thought, you know, if St. Paul were to walk into that restaurant in Noodles Nirvana in Berea, Kentucky, I think he would probably say, Thank God somebody finally got the message. <laughs> because Paul had been trying to teach the church for a very long time that very message. That we're not separate from each other, but we belong to each other because God has created us that way. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul very specifically designs an image for the church to understand that connection, that love, that idea that we do in fact belong to each other. Why did he have to do that? Well, the church is not always uh, the place that we find that kind of deepness of love. And I find that pretty sad and unfortunate. And in the olden days in Paul's day, that they had a struggle. Because you had Jews on the one hand and Gentiles on the other. And they didn't really mix all that much. There was a difficult, very, very harsh relationship in the early years. But in this church, in Corinth, it's a port city. A uh, city, a metropolitan city of all different kinds of people and religions and backgrounds. And somehow Paul, who plants all these churches, is able to plant a church where Jews and Gentiles and all these different backgrounds are able to sit and worship together in the same place. Except when he left, um, you know, he's not like, like your pastors who are here for a time. He, he plants and leaves, right? Except he had to leave. And when he left, the, there became a fracturing of the leadership. And there became a group of people over here who said, you know, uh, our gifts, and I don't know exactly what gifts they were, speaking in tongues, prophecy, whatever the gifts are, we heard some of them up here on the screen today. Um, those gifts are of more significance than these gifts over here. You might be able to teach and preach, and that's all fine and good and well, but we're over here and we've got the better gifts. We're much better over here. And it got to the point where they were so fractured from each other that uh, they began to do something really horrible, which is exclude people from this meal. Mm -hmm. Which, as Christ reminded us, so often as you gather, remember me, mm -hmm. and that all people, all, A-L-L, -L, all, are welcome at this table. They began to say, because you do not have this gift, you are not welcome at that table. Can you imagine, Pam, can you imagine, Marsha, Kenny, <coughs> you come up and, and, and they say to you, I'm sorry, uh, can you step over here, Paul, you, you, don't, you don't speak in tongues today. Um, yes, Nancy, great, you do speak in tongues, great, here you go. Can you imagine that? Not feeling welcome, you just sang this amazing song at the beginning of your worship about that kind of welcome you believe in. Imagine, imagine being told no at this table. <clears throat> that was what was happening. So Paul writes to them. He writes from a card. Now, there's no email. There are no text messages. There's no phone calls. This is days, if not months, of letters. We have the fortune of opening that mail 2,000 years later to see what he wrote to this church. And the beauty of this letter is he writes and says that we, as God's people, are like the human body. Now, those of you that are in the, um, the health field and the, um, uh, any kind of medical field know this, right? 
that all the parts of the body are all so interconnected that when one piece of that body begins to break down, it affects almost every other single part of the body, right? Um, it's a ba basic science, right? Back 2,000 years, Paul didn't have that kind of science, but he knew it. He knew that the human body had hands and feet and eyes and ears, and that every single one of those pieces matter. Every one of them. And that one of them can't say to the other, the hand can't say to the foot, I'm sorry, I don't have any need of you. Right? Uh, the eye can't say to the ear, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really need you. Why? Because where would the hearing be? You might be able to see, but how would you be able to hear? He's essentially saying, we need each other in order to survive. God created us as human beings in the very image of God to be interconnected to each other. We are just that threaded and connected. And our problem has been, the problem in Corinth was, we were living as if that were not the case. And all Paul does is write to them and say, if you want to be a follower of Christ, if you want to live a life of love, it's going to have to look like the human body, interdependent upon each other, loving each other, valuing one another's gifts and what one another brings to the table. The power of that is that there is a greater love that then can be shared with the world who does not even know that that kind of world can exist. That's what it means to be the church, the body of Christ. He says, you will now are the body of Christ. And what, what, what happens to one of us happens to all of us. That was just your prayer time just now, friends. You know, what happens to one of you happens to everyone in this room. And that's a powerful testimony to the love of God in your midst. And Paul was trying to say, when one of us suffers, all of us suffer. And when one of us is rejoicing, we all rejoice. Why? Because we belong to each other. Because God created us that way. So, if you walk into this restaurant and you see we belong to each other, you know immediately this is a different kind of love, a different kind of belief system, a different kind of thing that we see from the world in which we live in, where there are people who exclude one another from their gender or sexual orientation or their race or their class, right? There's a different kind of thing, a more excellent way. And so when he says there's a more excellent way, what he's referring to is the ethic of love. He goes on into to chapter 13 then, and love is what? Patient and kind and doesn't seek its own way, right? All of those things that we're familiar with. If you've ever been to a wedding, you know <laughs> what that scripture says and over and over. But you can't understand chapter 13. It's not about romance. I mean, you, I guess you could say it is, but it's not really about romance. It's about how we treat each other. And chapter 12 is how we get there. They were beginning to exclude one another, dividing from one another, not allowing one another's gifts to be valued in the middle. And instead, Paul says, strive after the greatest gifts. Faith, hope, and love abide. The greatest of these is love. I will show you a still more excellent way. That is what it means to be the church. Because we belong to each other. Here we are on this uh, second Sunday, really, after, after Christmas, on Epiphany Day. I, and I think we're, we're not reading the scriptures of Epiphany with the wise men and all that. But I, it, it makes me think, though, that on this Epiphany Day, that it is a wonderful thing that we celebrate Epiphany as a day of light in the midst of darkness. This idea that we are a people who live a different kind of world. A love that is unconditional. The love of God. We share that with one another. And that light, when so much of our world would rather have power over others rather than with one another, that there's a different kind of way. There's a different kind of way. The wise men chose to choose the way of light and of love rather than darkness. We live in this kind of world where we really need people of light, who are willing to continue in that path, that excellent way of love. In my very first week on the job, two, almost two years ago, I got an email from somebody in this congregation. We were about ready to go to General Synod, and uh, she says, um, I just want to be sure that you have all the information you need on the whole uh, Palestinian children, Israeli children question. Um, 
And your congregation was one of, I think it was 12 or 13, uh, either congregations or conferences that had signed on to a resolution helping Palestinian, Palestinian children in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And you, your congregation was uh, involved in two resolutions, both of which passed overwhelmingly. That is the excellent way, the way of light, of love, of standing up to say, we value the lives of Palestinian children. We value the lives of those that are LGBT. We value those who are at the border. In a couple weeks, I'm about to go to Arizona to the border. Those lives matter. Yeah. Yes. And you, thank you for your voice. Because we live in a world where that voice in the other direction is so loud. Thank you for saying yes to the way, the excellent way of love. In this vision that Paul has for us, that we are the body of Christ, you are only one congregation among thousands. But as Paul says, your may be the hand, and this group over here may be the foot, and together we are the body of Christ. Thank you for eight years of saying yes to God, of saying yes to one another, saying yes to Paul's vision of the excellent way of love. There is no other way but to demonstrate the love of God to one another. I want to close with this. Um, you may have heard this story before, but I'm, I, I share it a little bit, in a little bit different way. So if you've heard it before, just kind of bear with me a little bit. But it's one of my favorite because I think it really encapsulates everything that Paul was saying and what it felt like to walk in and out of that restaurant last year. There's a story of an old monastery, and in this monastery uh, are a group of monks. They were pretty famous monks because uh, people from all over the world would come to this, this particular monastery to pray, to worship, to learn about the love of God, what it meant to be the people of God. Uh, they would retreat there. People come all from, from all over. No one really knows exactly what happened, but over years of time and years of time and years of time, it got to the point where there wasn't many people coming to pray anymore. There wasn't many people coming, period. And there were only 11 monks and an abbot. Abbot spelled one T. It's better with two. Um, so the abbot finally got to a point where he decided, you know, this is, I don't know what to do. I don't know if God's telling us we need to close the door. I don't know if we need to be doing something different. We're not doing everything right. And so he said, we got we to gotta get together and have a meeting. Church, it would not be church. We didn't have a meeting. <laughs> so they called a meeting. And there they are, the 11 brothers and the abbot, and they're having this conversation. What do we do? And nobody knows what to do. And finally, one of them said, hey, would you please go out to the forest, that cabin in the woods, and see if the wise old rabbi would be willing to give his input and see if he has any ideas. Sure. He goes out walking out of the woods, and he gets to the, to the door. He's good friends with this rabbi. He knocks on the door. He says, Father, come on in. Let's have some tea together. And they're sitting, having tea. And, and the abbot begins to pour out his heart. And he says, oh, he's Rabbi, I don't know what, we don't know what to do. There's only 12 of us. And it feels to us like maybe we just need to ride this out and close the doors when all of us are dead. We don't know. Maybe God's calling us to something else. We don't know. Do you have any wisdom? And like any good rabbi pastor, priest, uh, the rabbi did a lot of, mm-hmm, yeah, a lot of head nodding, a lot of, yeah, I hear, L little speaking, a lot of listening, good pastor. At the end of that time, he said, do you have any wisdom for us? The rabbi said only one sentence. He says, my friend, the Messiah is among you. That's it. That's all you got. The Messiah is among you. What does that even mean? I don't know what that means. Oh, God. And, of course, he's panicking. He's sweating because he knows when he leaves, he's got a face to the brothers, right? And he does. He says, well, thank you, Rabbi, and, and uh, we'll take that into advisement or whatever. And he's walking back, and he's in a panic because he knows immediately walks in the door. There, sure enough, there they are. They're standing right at the door waiting to see exactly what happened. And, and he gets in. What did he say? Well... He only said one thing. He said, the Messiah is among us. And all the brothers are as dumbfounded as him. 
What? That's it? We send you into the, into the woods to get that? I was like, I know, that's all that he said. So they, they go in their different ways, and they're, they're walking in the woods, and, and they're going back to, to uh, reading and you know, washing dishes or praying or whatever it is they do. And they're all on their own, and they begin to, uh, at, separately and individually, ask the very important question. Okay, so, it's almost like a biblical literalist, right? Okay, so, if, if he, the Messiah really is among us, I wonder who he could be. And they... They, they began to say, well, if, if, if it's that person or that person, oh, gosh, I don't know. Who could it be? Well, it could be Brother Paul over here. He's very wise, very compassionate. Um, he knows the Bible. It could be Brother Tim over here. Uh, gosh, he, he's really gentle and calm and peaceful, a loving person. We know it's not Brother John because he's old and cranky and mean. <laughs> no, it's not that. <laughs> it could be one of those two. No, we don't know, and they finally got to the point where everyone decided, just made the decision, okay, so if we don't know who it is, then perhaps the answer is we need to start treating every single person as though they were the Messiah. Because who wants to offend the Messiah? Began to treat one another with grace, with compassion, with kindness, with empathy. And when they would probably be short with someone or, or angry with somebody or not listen or judge someone, there was more compassion than there was. They lived together for years, but all of a sudden there was this newfound love and care. And at the foundation of that very thing was the belief that every human being, every person that their eyes and ears would ever come across and see or hear was a reflection of the very image of God. Now friends, people started coming back to pray, back to worship, because they began to see and hear a new kind of way. Paul would call it the excellent way. At the very foundation of Paul's assumption in 1 Corinthians 12 is the belief that you, everyone in this room, is a beloved child of God. Everyone. And when you walk out the door, when I walk out the door, whether someone calls you a slur, a name, someone's mean to you, you have a disagreement, or they're the greatest things in sliced bread. Every person is a beloved child of God because they are a reflection of the very image of God. And the answer to everything from government shutdowns to discrimination to all the problems that we face Every single answer to that comes back to that our call as God's people is to love. To demonstrate compassion above all things. To stand for justice and peace. And to be about the work of the Spirit that binds us together as God's human family. And because I know who you are for eight years and God I hope for 800 more. May you continue to be that body of Christ who says to every person you come across, we belong to each other. I might be the foot, and you might not, you may be the hand, but I cannot save you. I have no need of you. I need you. Because we belong to each other. May that be your way in the next eight years and beyond. And may it be our way always. Amen. Amen. Indeed, we have chosen the better way, time after time. It's hard to believe it has been eight years. And I met some of you this morning, I know it's your first time, and some of you have heard this story. I'll be as brief as I can, but I want us to have this sense of inclusion as we prepare to look at reflection. On January 9, 2011, we started out in a borrowed chapel at Lexington Theological Seminary, and and today I want to give them thanks again for allowing us to do that. They had changed their curriculum to go to online classes. And so I went to them and said, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never been a pastor. I'm fresh out of seminary. I'm called to start this church. And we need a place to be. And I don't want it to be in, in a strip mall or, or you know somewhere. I, want, I think people want a sense of church. 
And they said yes. We are forever grateful to them for that. And in a minute you're going to see some pictures from that time in the chapel. The very first Sunday we had 63 people, but 49 of them were my family members. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to my mom and my brothers, let's have a big breakfast. So we did, Billy. We had gravy and biscuits and fried taters and fried apples and eggs and sausage and bacon and fruit. And we had a short service. And then we began meeting every other Sunday until September 9th of that year, which was the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and we held an evening service to commemorate that and invited folks in the community, and, and then we started meeting every Sunday. We continued to grow and learn. And to Chad's point, there's no <coughs> way I could have ever done this without your hands and your feet your eyes and your ears and your heart and your work. So thank you. Thank you. We have had folks come and go. I, I shared with Chad before that we've lost close to a dozen folks to death that were not just people here but rocks for us. That's hard for any church, but think about a young starting church. And then... And then we found out that the seminary was selling its, its entire campus to the University of Kentucky for a mere $13 million. <laughs> <laughs> Where to go now? I knew about this little church over here off Georgetown Road. They were pretty conservative. We're deciding to leave the United Church of Christ because the United Church of Christ if I'm correct, have back in 2005 voted as a denomination for marriage equality and to ask their clergy to bless those who loved one another even though civilly those rights would not be given. And so many left the United Church of Christ. Emmanuel was one of those churches that pulled back. And I knew of Miss Hattie, our Miss Hattie. <laughs> I had seen her at meetings. She went to all of them. In Indianapolis, in synods, and she would look at me, sort of cutting her eyes, a little bit like my little snoodle Winnie does. Just sort of <laughs> acting like she's ignoring me, but cutting those eyes. We were a progressive church across town, welcoming everyone. Not just from the LGBTQ community, but certainly that, and people of other faith traditions. Allowing couples who came to us, one Presbyterian, one Reformed Jewish, come on. Folks who practice Buddhism, come on. You're all God's children. Where to move? I called Rabbi Klein. Hey, you're not using your sanctuary Sunday. We need one. <laughs> and maybe we can learn from one another in the education wing. And he said, let me take it to the board. Quickly, he said, yes. You can use our sanctuary. We're in. Uh, and then a call from the conference minister in Indianapolis. Marcia, Emmanuel has closed its doors. And we're getting ready to put that property on the market. And those of you who know me know that I am just up front. What you see, what you get. And what he actually said to me is, I'm not sure if that was true. And I'm not sure if it's in the right part of town. Meaning that a predominantly LGBTQ congregation at that time would be coming smack in the middle of an African American neighborhood and a once conservative church. I came over here and you'll see in a minute, there were so many weeds around this place you literally couldn't see houses around. The city had condemned the property. And when I walked over here by myself that day, having lived in Lexington over 30 years, but never have been here. I felt the Spirit of God say, this is right where you need to be. So I then shared it with the church. And then they said, well, let's go over there. That we did. We got in that back parking lot. We, we walked around. Some of our folks who are the heads of the congregation were going, now where are the property boundaries? And we prayed. It was followed up with a meeting. That 
meeting where I met this wonderful woman, Miss Eleanor, and Miss Hattie, and about a half dozen others. It was hot that day. The building had not had heat or water or air conditioning for a very long time. It had not been taken care of. We walked in and about a three hour meeting. Hot. Outside and in. <laughs> The church was asking for another chance to, to be church. And, and I said and listened real patiently. And I've shared this with some of you. And I think it's important for us to know from where we've come. One person said, do not bring the gays into this church. And I was sitting back there quietly. And the conference minister, Chad, said, Pastor Marshall, do you have anything to say? And I said, I do. <laughs> Miss Honora, I will invite you to check me if I'm telling the truth about this. Okay. I said, first, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you've lost your church. I can imagine how painful that is. And if I can ever help you, I'm going to give you my card when you leave. And I'm a phone call away. Second, I said, I come from Eastern Kentucky, growing up Southern Baptist, and it took my mother 20 years to accept me for who I am. I get different beliefs and theology. I get it. But my mother is now an advocate and a member of our church. So there's always hope. Third, I said, I will never be a black preacher <laughs> whose parents are black preachers. I will never have that style, although I wish we had some come on and amen. <laughs> and I hear it sometimes. Fourth, we worship differently. We may believe differently. But in our church, we have everything from Pentecostal to high Catholic. And on any given Sunday morning, you cannot throw a dart at a diversity and not hit it. And then I said, I wonder what would happen in this small city of Lexington if we could find a way to be church family. What would it say to Lexington? And here we are. We've renovated twice. We've had 160 members or so come and go as churches have. And I'm hoping we're going to continue to have folks come and be a part of us because we need everyone. We need everyone to combat the messages of exclusion and who is in and who is out. Together, friends, we were the church who stand downtown for our immigrant brothers and sisters. Our refugee brothers and sisters. We're the church that was in Moorhead, Kentucky. The very first day they were allowed to issue marriage license. We were the church in Carter County. When Kim Davis was being released and it was a carnival atmosphere. No lie. Was selling funnel cakes and popcorn and, and signs and vans. And, and as I walked with my collar with a dozen or so of our people carrying signs that God is love. Being called every name that you could imagine. We were that church. We're the church that participates in interfaith worship services. Because we believe God is big enough for all of us. Yeah. No matter who we are or where we are. Right. We believe that we can follow our paths unashamedly and still allow room for others to follow theirs. We're that church. We belong to each other. So as we reflect a bit on this, grateful. That's what I am this morning. Grateful and hopeful of what we are to become.
Let us join in prayer together. Gracious and holy God, during this service we have been reminded of how we belong to one another and how we belong to you. We've been reminded of these past eight years we've had together, recognizing that whether we were here that very first day or today is our first day here. We still belong to each other, and we still belong to you. And so we come as, as kinfolks, as brothers and sisters, in a world that has lots of challenges, and we ask that you use this bread and this cup to give us strength for our journey, to remind us of our interconnectedness, to remind us that we are your beloved children. And at this table, no matter where we are in our faith journey, we are invited to remember the prophecy the message and the life of your Son and our brother Jesus, who taught us a better way, a better way to love, a better way to live, a way to include <coughs> all at the table. And he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We gather to remember the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples and followers, and so many scholars believe that there were other folks there that night. All the folks who were trying to follow that better way and were hunkered down in fear themselves. Women and children. So he gathered with them and he took a loaf of bread. And he blessed it. And then he broke it. He said, this is my life that I have lived for you. And every time you eat, I want you to remember me. For Jesus knew that he would not be with them very long in a physical way. I'm sure he could sense their anxiety and worry and fear and confusion even after the meal. And so as was his Jewish custom after supper, he took the cup and he blessed the cup. And he said, this cup is a new sign. It's, it's a covenant with you. It's a promise with you. That although I will not be with you physically, my spirit will always be with you to guide you, to lead you, to, to journey with you. Brothers and sisters, I have read and studied extensively all the, the gospel accounts of this Last Supper in an attempt to understand why some churches have rules about who's in and who's out. And what I have learned is that Jesus issued no rules to anyone. He just said, if you're here, you're welcome to the bread and cup. So you're invited, whether this is the first time you've taken communion or you can't count how many times, you're invited to take a piece of bread. And then after a time of meditation that is comfortable to you, we're invited to drink of the cup. May you sense the belovedness that you are to God and the connection we have to one another as you have communion this morning. May it be so. Friends, there is a gluten free option as well in the bread room.
opportunity to continue making a difference in the world and participate, I'd like to share a couple of notes from you. Dear Bluegrass United Church of Christ, thank you so much for your donation to purchase books for my Intermediate Book Club. Your generosity means more to me than you know. The students at Booker T. Washington Elementary, it's an at-risk school right down the street, will be able to read, discuss, and participate because of your blessing to us. These books will be enjoyed by many students for years to come. I appreciate you so very much. With prayers and thankfulness, Ashley Holden. And then from another school, right down the street, with thankfulness that my back is so good now I can bend and get them. <laughs> Bluegrass staff and congregation, thank you for all you do for our school and families at Coventry Oaks Elementary. We are so lucky to have you as a partner. <coughs> Merry Christmas, Tiffany Runyon and Coventry Elementary staff. Let us pray. Gracious God, you give us so many opportunities to use our unique creativeness to make a difference in our little part of the world. And we are grateful. You have blessed us with this congregation and and God, you have been with us every step of the way, sometimes pushing us along these past eight years. And we are grateful. You have given this beloved congregation and its members various gifts of time and talent, of resources, of creativity. And they give in so many ways, from taking care to make sure the lights are on and, and the building is clean, to making sure that everything administratively is okay, to, to being in worship, to being faithful in attendance and in giving, and we are grateful. And you have laid before us, within our reach, needs <coughs> of our community. You have laid before us an opportunity to be a light in this community, <coughs> to be a church that offsets exclusive messages in tight circles. You've given us the opportunity to sling our doors wide open. And we're grateful. It is out of this gratefulness that we go back to you in whatever way we can. And it is our prayer that we be good students and use all of these gifts to make a difference. May it be so. Amen.
leave our closing hymn is great is your faithfulness for how how God has been faithful to us all these years indeed in our lives. As we sing this song, maybe you've been thinking about joining our church family and, and thinking that this is a place at this point in your faith journey you'd like to call home officially. If that's something you'd be interested in doing, I would love to welcome you at the front and share that. And if it's something you want to talk to one of us about, our email addresses are on the front of the bulletin and we would welcome a conversation at any time. Let us sing together, Great is Your Faithfulness.